right, you guys, let's go ahead and get started. Um, lots of announcements here. Uh, this week we'll be finishing experiment three, um, at least the in-lab portion of it. You'll have a quiz. Make sure you're bringing your calculators for your quiz. You'll need them. Um, and your report for experiment one is due this week in your notebooks. So you'll be handing your notebooks in to us this week. So have those ready to go when you come to the lab. Um, this week, as far as open lab, we've got kind of a different schedule because of seminar and um, critical <coughs> issue symposium. So Wednesday, there's no classes. That means there's no open lab either. Okay, so the labs are closed on Wednesday. On Friday, we've got a combined chemistry and bio biology seminar at three o'clock. So that means that the labs will be open from 9:30 to 2:30. We'll close a half hour before that seminar. Okay, and that's in Graves on Friday um, in Winnipeg Auditorium. Next week, we'll be doing experiment five and six. The actual doing is experiment six. So that's what you will write your pre-lab over is experiment six. Okay. <coughs> and next week, I'll talk a little bit about the pieces of that pre-lab because it's a little bit different than the other ones you've written so far. Okay. Um, experiment five is teaching you how to use the IR, but you're not going to incorporate that into your pre lab. Um, and then in two weeks, your experiment three report is due. So right after we get back from fall break, even though we don't have lab that week, your experiment three uh, report will be due. So keep that in mind. All right. So a couple things to talk about um, from last week, kind of bookkeeping things before you get started with your hydrolysis reaction this week. So make sure, first of all, you weigh your trimeristin, okay? You need that dry weight and you need the weight of all of it. So not just take what you've got, weigh out what you need for your reaction and do something else with the rest of it. You need the trim the to weigh all of your trimeristin. You need this for your extraction yield. So you're going to end up calculating an extraction yield from the nutmeg. You need that total mass that you isolated, okay? <coughs> um, now, for part two, you're going to need 0.7 is what you need, okay? You can go all the way up to using a gram, but you don't want to use more than that, okay? So this is what your need is. If you don't have this much, then usually amongst the class sections, there's mo someone else who made more than they need, so we can donate back and forth as we need to, okay? But what you need is 0.7 grams, plus you're going to set aside 50 to 100 milligrams, so 0.05 to 0.1 grams for um, melting point analysis, okay? So all total, your need is 0.75 grams, all right? 0.7 here and a little bit set aside for melting points, all right? Now, you need to know how much you start with for the hydrolysis reaction. reaction as well okay so don't just take weigh weigh these guys out approximate what you've got and then just toss in whatever extra you've got make sure you know how much actually goes in the round bottom flask when you're setting up your hydrolysis reaction okay so for that reaction um, it's, all, it's known as hydrolysis but it's also known as saponification of an ester. And this comes 
from its relationship to what actually happens with soap, okay? Um, so you get soaps from basic hydrolysis <coughs> of naturally occurring fats. And that hydrolysis is called saponification. going to take our reaction factors and try and see how soapy they are, or how well they work on dirt, but what you should see is some characteristics of soap as, as the reaction is going on. You should see some bubbling. It should um, look like it's got some soapy, frothy characteristics, okay? So just keep that in mind as you're doing the hydrolysis reaction. In the end, when you're done with just the hydrolysis reaction, you're going to be at this point where you have the sodium salt of a fatty acid. So you should see, make some observations that um, what you see is acting like soap. So the actual reaction, reminder from what it showed last week, we've got our trimeristin. react it with sodium hydroxide. Now remember, we've got to pay attention to 
stoichiometry. So in the end, each one of these chains is going to form one molecule of myristic acid, one molecule of sodium myristate that will go to one molecule of myristic acid. Okay? So we need three equivalents of NaOH <laughs> for this reaction. Okay? So keep in mind stoichiometry is really important for your calculations. You've got to remember that you use three equivalents of sodium hydroxide and that you get three molecules of sodium myristate out of this reaction. All right? Now the reaction takes place in water, um, the sodium hydroxide is in water, as well as ethanol. Make sure you pay attention and grab ethanol out of a red can, not methanol. Your reaction is not going to work as well in methanol. So ethanol, and we're going to do the reaction at reflux. So in a second here, I'll talk to you about what that means. What you are going to get out of this then is three sodium myristates <coughs> plus you lose this piece the glycerol piece comes off And so you should see a difference as the reaction is progressing. This will not be super soluble in the sodium hydroxide and water and ethanol, but you should see a change in solubility as you go to the sodium myristate, because now the sodium myristate should be water soluble and soluble in that water, L, water ethanol mixture. Okay? So make, make sure you make those observations. Now, we want the carboxylic acid. So after um, we get our sodium myristate out, then we need to acidify the solution. To get the sodium the myristic acid as a solid. Okay. And again, three equivalents here. We need three equivalents. In, re in respect to um, trimeristin of HCl. And this is our myristic acid. Which is not So this reaction follows, you guys haven't covered this mechanism yet, so you can go over what is in your textbook, but you're not necessarily responsible for this mechanism yet because we haven't done it in lecture or you haven't covered it in lecture. You'll cover it in second semester when you guys cover esters. Um, with, with basic hydrolysis of esters, and this is on page 810 of the seventh edition of Murray or 792 if you're working from the 6th edition. Um, carbonyl chemistry is very similar with esters, amides. You're going to go through a whole, a whole segment of carbonyl chemistry in second semester. Um, what is usually happening is in the carbonyl, the oxygen is going to be more electronegative than the carbon. And so anything um, that is carrying any electrons that can be donated or any electron density that can be donated is always going to attack the carbon. Okay? And so our OH group from our sodium hydroxide is going to attack the carbon of the carbonyl and um, when it does that electrons 
from that double bond will go with the oxygen, okay? And so we'll have negatively charged species here for a little bit and a tetrahedral intermediate, which you'll learn in a little bit why tetrahedral intermediates are important. Um, <laughs> this is an equilibrium step, so it's going back and forth. Then we get our electrons coming back down to a double bond here with the carbon, and we lose our um, OR prime group, okay? So in that, in what we are doing, we're losing that glycerol group. Our OR prime group is our glycerol group, okay? Um, then we've got our acid, but in basic hydrolysis, it's going to take the proton away. So we've got this OR prime group that's negatively charged. It's going to take the proton away from our carboxylic acid. And so we, right here is basically our sodium myristate. You have to add acid to actually get it protonated to form the carboxylic acid. Okay? <coughs> And like I said, this is, this is in your textbook if you want to look over it. Now, a couple, a couple things about reflux. And I'll show you some the diagram of what you're going to be using. <coughs> so reflux is a really important technique in organic chemistry. Because it allows for, um, it's a method of heating a reaction at a constant temperature. <coughs> and so as often as possible when you're heating a reaction for a period of time, you want to be able to do it at reflux. It's a lot easier to keep things at a constant temperature that way. And so what it's dependent upon, the reaction temperature corresponds to the boiling point of the solvent. So you're going to be, you're going to have your reaction boiling in, its, um, in the reaction flask, okay? But the other thing that you need you're going to have boiling solvent, but you also need condensing solvent. So you need the react that um, boiling solvent to keep it at a constant temperature, because once something is boiling, no matter how much heat you give to it, it's going to stay at that boiling point. Okay? But you can't let that solvent escape, otherwise you're going to get to a point where you don't have any more solvent, and then then you've got, a trouble, got trouble as far as your reaction is concerned. Okay? So you, you're boiling your solvent, but you are also condensing your solvent. You've got to keep that solvent um, coming back into your reaction class. All right? And this is always the maximum temp of the reaction mixture. Um, and so, make sure that you, when you're doing a reflux, you've got good cooling of your condenser to get this condensing solvent, because sometimes, depending on the boiling point of the solvent, it's going to be a, a fairly hot reaction, depending on what you're using. So you've got to, you need um, good condensing as well. And so, the um, apparatus you guys are going to use this week We'll show you in lab how to set this up. It's a little less complicated than the simple distillation. So you're going to have, um, we're going to use our heating mantles for the first time. And most likely, instead of setting it up on an iron ring, you will put your heating mantle directly on your stir hot plate. That way you can use your stir bar to stir your reaction mixture. Um, if you set it up this way, it would work too, but it's going to work better for you if you can set it up on your stirrer hot plate. Okay, so you set your heating mantle on your stirrer hot plate, then um, 
you'll have your reaction flask, which is your lab manual calls for your 100 milliliter um, round bottom flask. You're going to have your solid trimeristin in there, your sodium hydroxide, and your ethanol <coughs> all in here with a stir bar. Make sure you clamp your reaction flask really tightly so we don't lose it, okay? Um, and then you're going to have your condenser as vertical as possible. You don't want it leaning right or left or front or back. You want it as vertical as possible to give the most efficient cooling um, and condensing to your reflux. Um, water in, again, just like with the simple distillation, goes in the bottom so that it fights gravity to go up and then water out the top. Make sure you use correct hoses for the distance you need to go between the sink and your apparatus so you're not flooding yourself or your neighbor. Um, and then you're going to have another clamp on this apparatus that is going to lightly clamp on the condenser and it's just there to support it so it doesn't go one direction or the other or front or back, okay? But you don't want it on there super tight because you want to be able to, once you're reflux is over, you can move this apparatus up and get it out of the heat so it'll cool faster out of that heating mantle because the heating mantles don't, don't cool super fast, okay? So you wanna make sure that this clamp isn't on there super tight, otherwise you won't be able to raise your apparatus up, all right? Um, and we'll check this before you start cooling and heating. Another big note is don't put anything in the top of the condenser, otherwise you'll have a closed system, okay? And then we would have a problem because you don't wanna heat a closed system because then we'll have pieces of glassware and so forth going everywhere. So um, make sure there is nothing in the top of your condenser. That is your out for um, pressure as you're heating your reaction, all right? Um, now this week, because you've got that solid trimeristin in there that's not going to be the most soluble thing, um, just stir your reaction as best you can, but as reflux starts, it'll get better. Okay, so you'll just kind of have to work with your stir plate and your stir bar to keep things moving. And then as it gets heated and things start dissolving, things are going to probably stir a lot better for you, all right? Um, when, you sh when you are um, setting up a reflux and going for a certain amount of time, the time starts when the boiling and the condensing of your solvent starts. So it doesn't start when you start heating, it starts when you start boiling and condensing. So you're going to reflux for an hour this week, that hour doesn't start until the boiling and the condensing of your solvent starts, all right? So you might want to turn your own mites to a setting of like seven or so to help things heat up, and then as things get refluxing, you can back them back down a little bit. So what you want... It's kind of like when you're cooking on the stove and you simmer something, you're keeping something at a, a constant temperature of the boiling water by simmering it, okay? That's the same idea here. So you don't want like crazy <coughs> boiling reaction, boiling up the condenser. You just want a nice boiling reaction, gentle boil, where you know it's boiling, but not out of control, all right? So once you get it up to boiling, then you may have to adjust your own light, but just be careful not to turn it off because then, or turn it down too far because you'll have to get it heated again and add time to your reflux time, okay? Um, now a couple things with this, like I said, you should see um, things happening as the reaction is happening. So just make sure you make observations of the reflux. So you don't want to just set it up and walk away. <coughs> You're going to need to get it up to the right temperature. You're probably going to be turning down the temperature a little bit. And then you want to see what's going on with that reflux and how it's changing as the reaction is progressing. Okay. Um, and do make sure that you reflux for one hour to get um, <coughs> the best yield for your reaction, and this will help you in the purification steps. Okay. 
All right, the rest of what I'm going to go over is basically your flow chart for the workup of experiment, so this part of the flow chart. Okay. So we'll have our reaction mixture. This is our <coughs> hydrolysis reaction mixture. It's then what we go on to do with the rest of it. Okay. So the first thing you need to make sure you do with the um, reflux is make sure it's cooled to room temperature, okay? You don't want to be working with any part of the workup afterwards until you have cooled it completely to room temperature. So um, you can lift your heating mantle carefully out of your, or lift your reaction mixture carefully out of your heating mantle. Um, but then make sure you're not doing anything with that reaction mixture until it has cooled down to room temperature, right? Um, one thing also, I forgot to mention with the heating mantles, remember they go into, on your hood, you have one plug with a switch and a dial. That's where your heating mantles get plugged into, the ohmite. Don't plug them into the wall socket, okay? Wall socket is 100%. Um, power, we don't want 100% power, we want less than that, so make sure it goes into the ohmite, otherwise it's going to get too hot, um, and you have to cool it down before you can use it. Um, after you are cooling it to room temperature, then you're going to be adding an HCl water mixture, okay? You've got this combination to kind of quench the reaction. So be careful. You've got sodium hydroxide. You've got um, HCl and water, okay? Um, there, you're going to have a reaction between the sodium hydroxide and the HCl. So it's not like you want to just dump everything all together. Kind of slowly add, add things together. Um, you're also going to have ice in your mixture, okay? Um, Make sure that the ice completely melts. So this is helping um, with the workup and cool things down and diluting the reaction mixture. Make sure that you um, add the ice carefully and you get it all completely dissolved before you're doing anything with the rest of the reaction mixture, okay? Now what you should have with the HCl is you should see your solid sodium myristate form, <coughs> sorry, myristic acid form. And then you're going to filter this. Um, just kind of be careful with this because it's it's a low melting solid. It only melts at 54 degrees. Um, it's going to be, because it's coming from the saponification reaction, it's kind of slimy and stuff, so it's kind of, it's sometimes hard to capture off of the insides of glassware and stuff, so just make sure you do a good job with this filtration and getting it off the insides of your glassware so that you have yield, okay? Because the next thing you're going to do is recrystallize it and so you need enough material to work with, work with, okay? For this recrystallization, you're going to recrystallize it from methanol. But it's really important that you don't get it above 50 degrees. So you're going to use your thermometer when you're heating your methanol. You're not going to just heat methanol on your hot plate till nearly boiling like we did with experiment <coughs> one. You've got to um, heat it to about 50 degrees because of the melting points of the myristic acid and the trimeristin. So myristic acid's 54, trimeristin's 56. If you get your methanol too hot, what you're going to see is what's called oiling out. So you'll have liquid methanol, and then you'll have just kind of this oil floating around at the bottom of the methanol, okay? So the same um, process works as what you did with experiment one as far as you'll have your solid, You'll be heating the methanol to 50 degrees. You'll add 
um, the methanol until you get the solid dissolved. But be careful with heating both of these that you're not getting them too hot because otherwise you're going to see what's called boiling out. Okay. Um, with this, it talks about a hot, filtra hot filtration again. Check with your instructor before you do that. If you decide you need a hot filtration, um, check with your prof first, okay? Um, then, as far as that product, we need to calculate percent yield of the um, maristic acid. So you're going to need the dry mass of your maristic acid. <coughs> it's not going to be dry this week. Okay? Um, and with this this part here, there's you're also adding adding water to so follow follow the instructions when it gets to the point that you're adding the water. The tricky part of the recrystallization is usually this part here, okay? So you'll need to come to open lab to get, get the dry mass of your maristic acid, okay? You also are going to need melting points of the trimaricin. and your maristic acid. So that's why you're holding on to the sample of your trimaristin for melting points. Now, um, I, so I've mentioned they have very similar melting points. There is not a standard trimaristin um, for you, you know, standard sample of trimaristin for you to sample and take a mixed melting point. There's not a standard maristic acid sample for you to take a mixed melting point to confirm their identities. So with the melting points of the trimaristin and maristic acid being so similar, how are you going to tell these apart? You want to confirm that you have all of it. So you could try that, but you may get some in and some out. So, And the maristic acid's not really going to be soluble in water either. Another question? Kind of along these lines. And experiment one. Right. But what do you want to see this time? Yeah, you, do, you don't want them to match, right? So if you take a mixed melting point of these two, then they shouldn't, you shouldn't see the same as the individual melting points, right? So it's the opposite of experiment one. So all three, so basically you need to collect three melting points. All three of them, you can collect in one, one time, okay? You know what range your trimaristin and your maristic acid should melt at because you know what you should have. So you don't have to do a slow and a fast. You could just do a slow melting point for the trimaristin, for the maristic acid. And if you make the mixed sample, you could run all three of them at the same time. So it shouldn't take really very much time at all to get these melting points, but you'll need to do it during open lab once everything is dry, okay? But now that you've gone through the process once, it should be much quicker, and you're only heating to the 50s, maximum 60 degrees or something, okay? So just make sure you collect all of this in time for your report that's going to be due in two weeks. Okay, so just there's not time in not necessarily time in lab for this because things have to dry. So this is something you're gonna have to remember to do on your own. Um, and then <coughs> kind of remembers reminders from experiment one, make sure I still have random samples that I've found. Um, label, again, we're gonna have two white to off-white solids that look really this very similar and everyone's gonna have them. 
label containers, label samples, put them back in your drawer, make sure you're really good with your housekeeping so we don't have a lot of things laying around and missing, okay? All right, questions you guys have? Okay, all right, we're done. It's your one bonus week, you get a little bit, out a little bit.